Welcome back to Worldwind Radio. This is Marcelo Subdeo. Google workers are calling on the company to stop developing AI for warfare. We will look at both sides of this story. Microsoft is adding ransomware protection and file restore to its OneDrive cloud storage. And is video game addiction a disease? The World Health Organization says yes. I'm sure you have deleted a Word file and afterwards thought, oh no, I need that file. Of course, as life would have it, this only happens after you have cleared your trash bin. If you're a OneDrive user, you'll be happy to know that Microsoft is introducing a new OneDrive files restore feature that will make it easier to recover from ransomware attacks. OneDrive users can now use it to simply restore files from any point in time within the last 30 days. So if you accidentally delete a file, you will be able to restore it. Or if you make some bad changes and want to roll back to an earlier copy, you can now do so. Microsoft is marketing the Files Restore feature as a good way to protect against ransomware and also to lock files onto a local PC. And often try to delete copies that are stored in sync folders, replicating those changes in the cloud. And we have seen a number of these attacks recently and victims have been forced to pay money for or to even try to get back their files. If OneDrive detects mass dele deletion of cloud files, Microsoft will alert users through an email or mobile or even the desktop notification and a recovery process will let you quickly restore to a time before the ransomware attack. Now this, according to Seth Patton, the general manager for Office 365, is the first of its kind in the industry. Along with this new file restore fe feature, Microsoft is also adding password protected sharing links for OneDrive to make it a little more secure when you have to share those sensitive files or folders. You can now set and require a password to access a shared on OneDrive file or folder, which protects it with uh, that link to the document in, in the event it was inadvertently forwarded. Outlook.com is also getting an update with email encryption for Office 365 subscribers. The email encryption can be enabled on individual messages and Office.com will even prompt you to encrypt emails if it detects information like social security numbers and messages. So that, that's, that's pretty cool. Recipients will be able to read the messages in Outlook.com, Outlook for iOS and Android, and also the Windows Mail app. Now, if you're not opening an email in Outlook's browser login or the mobile app or Windows Mail, then you will be directed to a trusted Office 365 web page to receive a one-time passcode. And that's a good feature to, to ensure that emails are opened on trusted and secure platforms. Also, Outlook.com users will be able to prevent recipients from forwarding or copying emails sent from that service. We are seeing more and more companies are moving to put a, a greater emphasis on security by protecting us and our information from cyber attacks. So here we see that Microsoft is introducing a new security feature for the its Office 365 suite. And this feature and features uh, not only aim to protect us from viruses and phishing scams, but also the increasing threat of ransomware. Also, I'm really excited about this. Starting later in 2018, links clicked on, in, for example, in Word, Excel, or PowerPoint files will be checked in real time to find whether the destination website will likely download mal malware or even be part of a phishing scam. So that's really cool. Now, OneDrive's file restore, the ransomware protection, and Outlook.com encryption will start rolling out to Office 365 subscribers shortly and in the coming weeks.
Thousands of Google employees have signed a letter to CEO Sundar Pichai, protesting the company's work assisting the U.S. Department of Defense to develop computer vision AI. These employees are calling on Google to cancel its subcontracting role in the DoD's Project Maven, for which it's developing tech to detect and track moving vehicles and other targets from U.S. military drone video. Through this project, DoD is looking to develop or deploy computer algorithms to war zones by this year end, and also in the AI arms race. The employees in the letter wrote that Google is already struggling to keep the public's trust due to fears about bias and weaponized AI. The letter states, "We believe that Google should not be in the business of war." So they are asking that this project be canceled, and that Google create a new policy stating that neither Google nor its contractors will ever build warfare technology. I find that this is a little too demanding from the employees of Google. A company with the resources of Google has the means to keep abreast and even stay ahead of new technologies, and if this is not done. As in this case, with developing AI for defense-related uses, then someone else,、uh, another company, will do it, putting Google at a disadvantage. Since, as I have said, they have the resources to work on projects of this nature. The other thing to consider as well: if Google is to stop this, then who says that another enemy state tech company wouldn't develop such technologies? That can be used against Americans. The staff argued that Google can't excuse its participation because Microsoft and Amazon are also helping the Pentagon to develop AI capabilities. The employees are trying to make the point that Google will now be joining defense companies like Raytheon and General Dynamics. Other tech companies like Microsoft and Amazon are also participating in defense-related technologies. So why can't Google be involved? Well, according to the staff, it's about Google's motto to "Don't be evil," and also it's a direct reach into the lives of billions of users that should and that should really set Google apart or not to be involved in this. Now, what's important to note, and this was highlighted by Google, is that the AI will not directly operate drones. Or be used to launch weapons. What this technology does is to flag images for a human to review, and and it's it's not, or is non-offensive, in nature. So, in my opinion, I don't see the big issue that these employees are trying to make out of this project. If this concern is raised or not, Google will continue to develop AI and machine learning technologies. They have to. In order to stay on top of the tech field, and this is what Google is all about. Google is not going to be a defense company; it is a tech company, and will continue to develop tech to remain competitive, to stay on top of their game, and also to provide a secure service to its many users. If they are not going to do this, then we all have to ditch Google services, as it will make it. Riskier to protect our privacy and information. In its upcoming June update of its International Classification of Diseases, the World Health Organization will include gaming disorder, and this is a pattern of behavior, according to the WHO, that is characterized by impaired control over gaming. Increasing priority given to gaming over other activities, to the extent that gaming takes precedence over other interests and daily activities, and continuation or escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences, and that's from the WHO. A diagnosis would recognize a significant impairment in personal, family, social, and educational. Or even occupational and other important areas of functioning, and would normally have been evident for at least 12 months.
So I just wanted to give you those definitions as we head into this story. A study was done recently in Ontario that estimated that 13% of Ontario students, or almost 123,000 children, have experienced symptoms of video gaming problem, which was up from 9% in 2007. About one in five boys reported having problematic symptoms linked to their video gaming. The WHO has been studying this issue since 2014, while the American Psychiatric Association has flagged internet gaming disorder for further study and consideration since 2013. These two organizations are the main groups that the medical community looks to for guidance and diagnosing and even treating of patients. One professor says that he gets a call at least once every two weeks from a parent who says, I can't get him off his computer, or I can't get him off his cell phone because all he wants to do is to play these games. Video game addiction is clearly a growing problem, the professor said. Now, this is not the only issue of not being able to get a child off playing video games. There have been a number of instances where individuals have actually committed suicide because they weren't able to, to have access to their computer for gaming. And that's very serious. Imagine the magnitude of this problem, of just playing video games and then allowing the self to become so engrossed with this that you no longer have self-control to stop it. And then, when it's not available, people are so depressed and basically they have lost all hope and then they decide just to end it all by killing themselves. Video game organizations are calling on the WHO to not add gaming disorder in its next report. A statement from this group says, the WHO's process lacks transparency, is deeply flawed, and lacks objective scientific support. It went on to say that we urged this process to be halted and added that the educational, therapeutic, and recreational value of games is well established and recognized. I'm not a video gamer and I don't play video games, period. I think there is an underlying issue here, though. It's about training and educating our kids from an early age of the dangers of video games and being hooked on gadgets and to do something more wholesome like physical activities. I was speaking to a, a fellow staff member just before recording and she told me that uh, she and her husband in the past few years have been playing video games and sometimes every evening like for maybe an hour and a half they're on their video games. And so I said, well, are you still playing games? She said, no, we've stopped. And so I asked her, why? How did that happen? And she said, well, um, we now have a child. So it's about doing something else in, 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 in replacing that, the video games. And there are many things that we can do, like reading and, and, or even playing outdoors. But to get to that point, it starts with how we are educating our children from a young age. And this is not a put down on parents, but, but we have a responsibility to help our children stay away from addictions like video games and give them a life where they can see some purpose, have energy, have fun, and to have self-control when, when something that does not seem right, to just say no and let it go. Thanks for taking the time to join us on today's show. I would love to hear from you. Please send me an email at marcelo at promotivemedia.ca. We may even read your email on the show. You never know. From the rest of the team here at Whirlwind Radio, this is Marcelo Sigdeo in the light of the news we've covered today saying, stay safe in the technology world. Thank you.